Harry, you have some splaining to do. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, thank you, Chun. Thank you, everyone. Um, particularly, thank you, Umberto Sandoval, who's here. Um, we've known each other for more than 50 years. So. <clears throat> and this is uh, the 40th uh, anniversary, I guess, of the broadcast of this uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, video. Um, it, maybe a little bit about uh, Imperfecto, how it all started? Uh, yeah, uh, say a little bit about that, because... Uh, so, um, uh, I guess uh, uh, Imperfecto uh, in 1982 would have been 10 years after um, I co-founded OSCO, and OSCO had been uh, primarily uh, performance-based, uh, utilizing photography, the other artists that were painters, um, and um, a, an incredible violent history in East LA um, kind of produced um, an alternate way to respond to um, police shooting at you, um, all my friends uh, being drafted and killed in Vietnam, um, many other kinds of things that normally send people into a dark corner. Um, my approach has always been to laugh in the face of, uh, of uh, danger. In fact, I've always encouraged my friends to have fun in dystopia. And so um, uh, this piece uh, 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 was uh, sort of a first attempt to deal with video. Um, very much like the previous, it was shot in the early beta. Mm -hmm. uh, and then bumped up to three quarter, and then um, and then uh, uh, broadcast through public access. Uh, Falcon Cable had a particular uh, uh, subscribership, and it was all along the coast of uh, Southern California, I believe, from uh, Santa Barbara to San Diego, which of course is um, uh, the least ethnically diverse and the wealthiest uh, <laughs> uh, neighborhoods, um, uh, bringing East LA directly to Malibu. And so, um, uh, and, and again, uh, a part of this uh, also includes um, uh, the inherent uh, sense of um, humor that comes from being Mexican Chicano uh, and, uh, and really a, a kind of a playing with some of the, the pop uh, cultural aspects. Um, again, uh, as, as is mentioned, it's the purposeful uh, I mean, just the overall degradation of the imagery in a way, and sort of the straight cuts, uh, uh, kind of were a, a, a rejection of, of uh, sort of broadcast television, uh, also the need to arrive at um, superior funding to uh, uh, create imagery, which of course, mm -hmm. which was OSCO in the first place, was uh, to create images, um, no movies as it were, uh, which was to create, instead of making a movie, to basically make the single frame uh, that would be remembered as we all remember most films was just sort of a, a mm. brief flickering frame. Now, what's interesting about Osco and about this, uh, your, the videos that you did in this time, is a lot of the media being produced by Chicanos at that time was really documentary based, uh, historically framed, it was tied to cer certain key moments uh, or, uh, or forms in terms of heritage from Mexico. Yeah. This is all about downtown LA. This is all about oh, yeah. the 80s and, and the fashion. Right. I, the, the, the stroke of genius is that um, Umberto's finding a really wild set of clothing there on the oh. street. Yeah. <laughs> um, say what your, think your experience at that time or your thinking was in terms of... Um, breaking from that sense of an obligatory anchoring in the Aztecs through the Mexican Revolution? Well, um, again, uh, I think when I started elementary school, I spoke only um, the Chicano dialect known as uh, Caló, which emerged out of the Mexican Revolution <laughs> in the first place. And of course, the Aztecs uh, runs through all of our veins, and so no need to really discuss that. And, um, and of course, growing up in Los Angeles uh, during the, the Atomic Age, um, uh, uh, and being very okay. imbued with uh, hold the microphone, I believe. Be, being imbued with uh, uh, sort of pop culture, and I've, I've mentioned before from any rooftop in Boyle Heights, you can see the Hollywood sign. Mm -hmm. But it's like looking at Mars in terms <laughs> of its uh, proximity and, and accessibility. So uh, it was always a, a matter of um, creating something that would uh, uh, utilize the urban scape, as it were, mm -hmm. uh, an environment uh, to which we're suitable suitably adapted, and, uh, and to have fun, to have mm -hmm. fun in the midst of the milieu of, uh, 
of the dispossessed. And what did downtown mean to you at that time? Um, uh, well, um, for me, it was my university. It was my education. I actually uh, never attended school at all. I um, graduated with a 0.0, .0 GPA. Uh, it was quite wonderful. Um, my diplomas and still clinging to some alley. Uh, but um, uh, uh, downtown Los Angeles, of course, has undergone great transition. At this point in time, it was still a place where people would shop and wander and hang out. And of course, uh, now it's kind of a cross between a, a sort of a, a, a gentrified and yet drug drug den. So mm -hmm. uh, back then, people actually used downtown, and uh, uh, and of course, it's um, it's uh, 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 I don't know. I guess um, it was again instead of a playground, it was um, much better to play in the wasteland. Now, my right is is when Barbara Carrasco retrieves Imperfecto, and do they end up in Philippe's? Is that Yeah, they wind up in Philippe's, okay. so it's, um, uh, and of course, Barbara Carrasco um, is my wife, and uh, it looks very much like my daughter now. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> but um, uh, the, the, many of the, of the performers in, in this piece were um, uh, what some people refer to as the B Osco, and so this would have been additional people that joined Osco in the 80s, uh, just before it, um, it imploded, exploded, and, um, and then actually concurrently today, they're having a big event about Osco today for some movie they're making about Osco. I have no idea what it's going to be they're, like. They're but, uh, taking you there by helicopter. Yeah, you this, know, right? so, but, um, <laughs> but uh, uh, you know, this was a sort of a, a culmination of, I would say, of what uh, the end of a particular era, which more or less would have been my youth, yeah. transitioning into something else and a whole different kind of uh, thinking and uh, relationships. So it, mm. it, um, it would be like reading maybe the first two novels by Dostoevsky and you've still got to get through the other six. So, it's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, so it was uh, you know, sort of a, 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 a countdown as it were uh, towards the end of the 20th century um, and of course, when we all were in, 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 engulfed with 20th century angst, that we might actually live into the 21st century. Indeed, and what really struck me this time is the, the one, the nature of the photography of shooting through uh, downtown, but also the way in which uh, Umberto's character really fits in. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that you're capturing that sense of a, a transition, the, the kind of mercantile dimension of it, uh, you know, the, the kind of homeless and the kind of what the frame of the story alludes to is uh, in some ways the deinstitutionalizing of people under the Reagan era. Right, so. of course. And, and again, sort of the breakdown of the safety net, uh, mm -hmm. sort of the privatization, the elimination. Mm -hmm. And of course, I took a, a drive through downtown yesterday and all the places that were brand new and shiny at that moment in time. 40 years later, they're all boarded up and uh, <laughs> windows are painted black. And, um, yeah. and, so it's a, and again, it's sort of a, a commentary in Los Angeles, uh, being a place of erasure and amnesia as opposed to mm. one that uh, pays respect to history. Now, you're from East LA. And uh, during this time, I, I believe Philippe's was your office. I, yeah, I um, <laughs> had a few places that I've always done things. That, and uh, I guess that's the connection was with uh, Chon Noriega and I was that um, I would often have uh, people meet me at Philippe's, but of course people get stuck in traffic and it's got free parking. And, and when they didn't show up, I'd be scribbling a few lines or two. And um, uh, one day Chon uh, managed to come across some of these scribblings and it turned out he once had it typed and um, turned into like a 2000 page manuscript. <laughs> and he wound up becoming the editor of my book called Urban Exile, which is, um, kind of an expansion of Imperfecto. Which I, I don't think has been appreciated enough as the literary intervention it, it, uh, it is. Uh, it's a, maybe it's too long. Uh, it's Dostoevsky uh, yeah, uh, yeah, length. So. But uh, you shared, uh, you, you used Philips as an office because they had those wooden phone booths. Yeah, and of course <laughs> back then there was no such thing as, uh, as uh, cell phones or mobile phones. And yeah. <laughs> there was a bank of public phones in which uh, many, many familiar uh, uh, bit actors and sometimes very famous actors uh, would be uh, using the phones, receiving their so It was not uh, just me that was using this place, but um, uh, uh, Philippe's also was a place where um, uh, many politicians and different kind of people that would eventually 
run for office and win. Yeah. And so it became sort of this sort of public space uh, for a very long time. Um, and, uh, uh, and I think that kind of ended when uh, the day that uh, Michael Jackson was acquitted and a riot broke out there. Michael Jackson? Yeah, yeah. Michael Jackson was acquitted from whatever they had charged him <laughs> oh, with. the Neverland uh, trial. Yeah, yeah. And so, um, <laughs> um, and people throwing sandwiches at each other, and I decided that I would have to change offices. I remember we met, I met you there for the first time uh, in 91. Oh, yeah. And you were telling me about this nervous little guy that was kind of flitting around and going to the phone nervously, and it turned out to be Paul Rubens. Uh, yeah, of course, it was a Pee Wee Herman was one of them. Yeah, of course, so, uh, Before Pee Wee's uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. playhouse. Yeah, so it's, um, uh, and, uh, and again, many of the places in, in, in this space, it was also Bunker Hill, of course, mm -hmm. which uh, many of the locations were at. And, and of course, Bunker Hill is um, recognized as being the financial district, but actually it was um, the place for one of the great last battles of the Mexican-American War. And I was born a hundred years after that. But uh, uh, the, the Bunker Hill, of course, was overtaken uh, by a battalion uh, that was paid uh, $5 a head for every Mexican. And so, um, you know, I've actually uh, have offered uh, uh, $5 uh, per head <laughs> to show up in Bunker Hill. So it's the opposite, and so, so it's, uh, and of course it's been leveled now, and uh, and of course there's uh, there's mocha, and currently some of my work is hanging there. So it's all kind of very strange kind of juxtapositions of things. So money's always been an issue here, and yeah. and, and one, the other reason you uh, your office was at Philippe's was. Um, besides the uh, wood chips on the floor, the coffee was only a dime, and it had yeah, only was, ever been a dime, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, coffee was a dime, and it lasted all day long. And so it was one of these places that was uh, probably safer than the library. So there you go. But it seems to me a lot of your, your aesthetic is driven by the finances. It, it, you, you, you talked about the, you know, the kind of, uh, the conceptual work was obviously the least expensive. Um, but working in video, and even though it was home video um, or you were using public access, it, there were still costs and it, it limited. Um, but your real passion has been photography. Right. And that you forgot to pay for. And you, you, you largely shot slides like a lot of photographers at that time because it was easier to show them yeah. than to make prints. And I, I remember asking you, um, so what do you do when you don't have the money? I, said, I write. Yeah, yeah, so. <laughs> so. yeah, and um, you know, the, the thing about the photography, of course, I um, actually Umberto Sandoval was with me when I purchased my first camera, mm. and uh, I had done a little bit of research. Were and, you both uh, running? Uh, no, 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 <laughs> no. I, uh, it, um, it was uh, Minolta 101, and uh, this is way back in the 70s, and there was a sort of an, a, an engagement between Japanese, uh, Austrian, and German manufacturers uh, coming up with a new way to deal with 35 millimeter. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so it turned out to be, and then I realized that in Hollywood, uh, Kodak actually produced a very specific form of ectochrome film. Mm -hmm. And it was the same stock that was used by Paramount yeah. Studios, MGM. And so the whole idea was to create imagery that looked very cinematic and in effect. And, uh, and actually that's exactly what yeah. happened. Yeah, and I think a lot of people don't, don't realize uh, certainly your photographs are very compelling um, they're often confused with the performance right um, but the fact that down to the material the the nature of the stock that you've used uh, the wide angle lens uh, right. you use, the, the positions you shoot they really create this very compelling counterpart to Hollywood cinema in the classical sense right and so again um, uh, for many, many years, uh, the photographs actually had not been printed. Uh, and, um, and when they were printed against, uh, it also dealt with the language, institutional language, trying to define uh, what was it that was being seen. But, you know, again, uh, in the art canon, the photograph is the art. Mm -hmm. and, and that was always the intention, that the mm -hmm. photograph is the art. And uh, whatever was taking place in front of it, whenever I directed imagery to be formed, it really is the decision of, when you shoot, what you shoot, and understanding the physics and the social interactions, um, and pictures don't make themselves. And so, yeah. you know, that's... Well, having worked with you for three de and over three decades, um, there are a lot of outtakes. There are a lot of images that were not selected for yeah. either projecting or, or making prints. Um, and those represent uh, kind of loosely a documentation of an effort. Yeah. Uh, then there's the work that represents a kind of um, 
an idea that's trying to be conveyed relative to the medium, right. uh, photography, right? And, and I, I would have to say that the same thing happened with the video. It was yeah. um, uh, very specific to try to construct something. As you mentioned, uh, most of the videos I made were shot, written and shot in a single day, edited the next day, and then I would make duplicate copies and send them to other places, but particularly show them on, um, on, uh, on public access. One of the things that's not mentioned is that they had very few people contributing so that, uh, for instance, uh, Imperfect, I believe, must have showed five times a day for several years. <laughs> and I'm sure there's some people that maybe drinking beer wouldn't yeah. change the channel. And so it, it became quite, uh, you know, I'm not sure if people in the, uh, somewhere maybe in, in the, you know, the South Bay were walking like Humberto Sandoval, but it became very infectious in a way. And, uh, and again, some of the other uh, 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 videos, uh, which, by the way, are going to be screened at the Museum of the, uh, of the Academy Museum of uh, Motion Pictures in May, yeah. um, uh, that, um, uh, you know, very few actually survived, uh, for instance, because mm -hmm. uh, most of them were uh, then left at the studios and things would get stolen, get mm -hmm. erased. Um, and again, that was sort of the whole, um, and, that, and I think that was kind of the built-in fail-safe for much of the work. So yeah. much of the early OSCO works were um, created on, uh, let's see, the physical objects were made with butcher paper and things that would disintegrate, and many of the objects were left behind. And even maybe some of in the writings, I would just leave them on the tables, they would blow away. Uh, some people would memorize them and use them, uh, uh, stand on their own street corners and preach that. And so it was always this idea of, uh, you know, what is it that actually survives the, the event of being in L.A.? And it's very, very uh, small amount, actually. Then it's sort of a, a, of a distillation of what is it that uh, yeah. uh, was endurance and what actually can survive um, the condition that we're in. You've been this paradoxical figure as the archivist of the ephemera of an invisible population. And when I first met Harry, uh, I was trying, I was very much in the archival mode. I'd kind of uh, been yeah. trained in, you know, in archiving and archival description uh, as a graduate student at Stanford. And I kept pushing you and you kept denying the existence of anything right. uh, until we sat down to go through and actually uh, deposit, you know, the materials uh, at Stanford, yeah. and that's when I realized just how much you had written. Um, but the other part were the videos as well, uh, they, and and the Super 8, which I think a lot of it just was eaten up in the projectors as, yeah, as part of installation-based yeah. work uh -huh. in the 70s. Um, but to gather those materials together, and it's been about almost 20 years since uh, we worked together and, and I had those kind of remastered on a beta at, at BayVac just because uh, in general television was, you know, uh, re, you know reusing, uh, uh, taping over yeah. uh, things. Uh, and, but you, you left, you took the U-Matics, you, you kept those, but they had been recycled many times yeah. in the yeah. process. So it was really an urgent uh, issue yeah. to kind of be able to uh, preserve those. Yeah, when I would uh, transfer from uh, the beta to the three-quarter, I mean, there were completely degraded tapes to begin with. Yeah, you know, so. yeah. Now, I know we've gone past the time. Should we wrap up here? And uh, yes. uh, I want to thank Harry uh, for the conversation, for sharing this work. And they will be showing other works, um, the other works uh, at, uh, at the Academy. And definitely want to thank uh, um, Umberto for uh, showing Umberto, up here tonight. Umberto, if you don't mind tonight. standing up, Umberto. Yeah. <laughs> um, Umberto is in a lot of uh, Harry's videos, and Harry always pairs them with his wife, and they're kind of uh, an on-screen couple yeah. that is really interesting to trace the trajectory of that from this film through what, L.A. Familia? Yeah, actually the first time Barbara met Umberto was when he was under the palm fronds. She yeah. had no idea he was there. So it's, uh, now of course we're really good friends, but of course it was, uh, uh, you know, I met, uh, she's someone that can handle anybody anywhere. Yeah, well, she seemed to <laughs> take care of it. Yeah, by the way, she's a UCLA alum, so that's, uh, there we go. that's kind of the uh, categories. Well, thank you, Harry. Thank you so much. Uh, thank, thank you, you all. Mark, okay?